Ah, it was goody day. So I might save this and I might actually have to do this. Well, actually, it's not a I might have to. I'm going to have to <laughs> do this over numerous videos. Um, but uh, went to a public auction. I've been going to auction since, well, hell. <laughs> I, was pro I was probably in a, in a, a baby carriage, <laughs> you know, being wheeled in, you know. But uh, I grew up in auctions, and then as a as a kid, oh God, I'd hate to think how many thousands and thousands of public auctions I've been to in my life. Because when I, I was a kid, for for several years, I helped out a guy, got all through middle school and high school during you know summer vacation when most kids are out just being kids. I helped out a he's still a good friend of mine. Um, he was an antique dealer and. Did some, did some TV repairs, so that's mainly what got me, you know, be friends with him. But, uh, yeah, and God's, during summer vacation, I could go to 12 to, God, probably over 20 auctions a week. <laughs> We'd hit, you know, multiple auctions a day. Um, but anyhow, so, you know, auctions are no new thing to me, and I'm really good at sniffing out a good auction, you know, being able to read between the lines and auction notices and, you know, which ones might actually contain stuff I might be interested in. And anyhow, found one, um, went to it, and <clears throat> there was a, as I kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a frog jump down my throat, um, had a uh, listing, you know, some electronic stuff. And I, you know, kind of look in pictures and stuff's under tarps. So I, you know, every once in a while I see a corner or something peeking out, and I was like, ah, yeah, I think that'd be the one to go to. So... Anyhow, I went, and I came back with probably, I don't know, somewhere near a thousand pounds, actually probably a little bit more, um, and uh, I thought I'd show some of it, and this is just something to be aware of. Uh, you know, People ask me oft, often, where do I get all the shit that I have, in the vast quantities that I have it, and the, the short answer is public auctions. Um, like I say, I'm good at finding auctions, but, uh, you know, because in any given day, especially on weekends like Saturdays and Sundays, hell, there might be a dozen, two dozen auctions in your area. So, you know, picking which one you want to go to can be the thing. I, I can, you know, make or break you from how much shit you're going to come home with. But, uh, so, if this one, yeah, this this one now, it, it mainly, a lot of the electronics test equipment all looks to have been from a community college, actually just down the road a ways from me down in uh, Catonsville, Maryland. Um, because a lot of it still has the ID tags that says Catonsville Community College. Uh, a lot of other stuff I get, and I'm assuming whoever this person was probably passed away. It was, it's all at a public auction. That's usually how they work. You know, it's an estate being cleaned out. But I'm assuming this person bought it from them at a, at a probably, you know, uh, liquidation auction at the auction at some point in time um and had just kind of like me collected it you know it's uh so in any case i got uh four of these these are uh and of course i gotta fire some of this stuff up just to see if it works um a lot of the stuff really has no practical not so much a practical use nowadays I've got modern equipment that can do it in you know something probably you know the the circuitry that's like in this can be done with other stuff that's, you know, basically a one-chip wonder nowadays can do, you know, one one small microprocessor, a crystal, and a couple passive components can do everything that this thing does. But back in the day, this was top of the line. So what this is, is a Textronic uh, Type 184 time marker generator. Um, this is, I got four of these. Um, I was actually going to just leave these there, and I thought, nah, look, for starters, being a pack rat, um... But the, the main thing was parts. Um, I didn't really expect any of these to work. And actually, this one is attached to the oscilloscope over there. <laughs> and you can see it's actually outputting. Uh, if I figure out which button. No. Which buttons to push here. That's one second. There's ten milliseconds. Um, of course, this thing would need to be completely gone through. Um, you know, recap the alignment. Well, actually, I don't know. I mean, it's <laughs> the caps seem to be fine. The current draw on this thing is almost nothing, um, other than when the oven turns on, which is one of the main reasons I brought it home. Um, because this is late, really, really late 1960s vintage. 
So it's solid state with the exception of six tubes. It has six Nuva stores. So this little guy here, there's actually two of them right here. Okay. Then you can see, unlike a, uh, a Nuva store like you'd see in some radios, uh, these actually have caps on top of them. And then there's another two here. And actually, I think the other two are on the bottom side, if I remember right. But it has six Nuva stores. So yeah, like I say, there's one, two, three, four. And you know, like I say, you can see they actually have little caps on them, um, which is kind of oddball. Uh, you know, Textronics, absolutely king of the pile back then. They were, you know, I'm not going to say they were the only company, but they were the, when you walked into a laboratory back then, um, it was all Textronics equipment. And when you walked into a repair shop, it was no Textronics equipment because this shit was expensive. In 1960, uh, what was it, 68 or 69, this thing was close to $700. So, yeah, that's, you know, I'd have to get out, I'd have to go onto the, uh, uh, actually, we'll just do that real quick. I'll grab my tablet. I'd just be curious to see how much this thing cost. You know, accounting for inflation, how much this thing would cost nowadays. Uh, let's see here. Bookmarks. CPI inflation calculator. That's the uh, uh, government's uh, website. Well, let's see. I think it was 600 and like 90 something, maybe. So we'll put that in 19. I think that was like 68 or 69, so I'll just make it 1969, and calculate, and that'd be $4,537 um, for just a marker generator. <laughs> this thing really does nothing more. It's a time marker generator. Uh, you know, very simplistic in what it does by today's standards, but uh, back then it was an advanced piece of kit. Um, you know, let me turn this off. Now, actually, the oven stays on. There's a little light on the front here. Um, and actually, that's another thing, the lights. If this light bulb ever burns out, yeah, it just unplugs. <laughs> Lots of nifty little stuff like that. But, uh, so it's got a crystal oven right here. And, yeah, she's nice and warm, made by Bulova. Uh, actually, I think that's the same people that made watches. They were known for time-type stuff back then. But it's a 10 megahertz uh, crystal oven, which is one of the reasons I brought this home, because I thought they did have socketed uh, crystal ovens. Let me turn my isolation variable power supply off, which is what it was actually plugged into. We'll get this, it just goes into an octal socket. Come on, little guy, here we go. So, as you can see, 10,000 kilocycles, or 10 megahertz, but uh, yeah, 75 degrees C operating temperature. And actually, if you just take these three little screws loose, you take the can out, there's a big crystal in there, with a shitload of wire wrapped around it, and there's a uh, switch in there that turns, you know, turns on and off to turn the, the heating coil on. But this thing operates on either 120, or actually 110, or uh, 220 AC volts. So the coil is actually attached straight to the mains. It goes straight up to the, uh, the, power, the power switch on the underside of this to select, you know, the input voltage. And then it just selects how many wraps of that heating coil element to uh, energize. But... Uh, yeah, like I say, you know, I got a couple of these, um, you know, everything is socketed, <clears throat> all of the uh, semiconductors are, they're plug-in, um, actually I have to get the BNC cable off here, hadn't really planned on going into detail on this, and honestly, since I got four of these, just for shits and grins, I might actually restore, I might keep one of these, um, you know, it's one of those, eh, why not, <laughs> But uh, there's the underside, you know, and you can see you know, the gold-plated gold boards. You know, just man, just quality, just build quality. You just don't see nowadays. I mean, look at the the tie point strip there. The hell, that looks like it's yeah, it's ceramic. Sits in little holders. I mean. Just really, really nice quality. And I knew there'd be a lot of good parts in here that are usable in radios. You know, like there's lots of small air variable trimmer capacitors. 
So yeah, I might actually keep one of these. Oh, and here's the other the other two vacuum tubes. There's one here and one here underneath these little black black hats right here. But uh, yeah, lots of trimmer capacitors. So there's lots of parts in here that I can use in other stuff. So I'm like I say, I might actually just keep one of these. I'll pick the one that's in best physical condition. Don't really so much care about the uh, ele electronically working condition because. When I gut stuff like this, I usually will keep the circuit boards for stuff like this. I'll label them, put them into inventory, you know, that way if I ever need parts for one, so... But it still, it shrinks the size down vastly. Then I can, you know, recycle all the aluminum. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I might actually keep one of these. Not that I have any practical use for it. Like I say, I've got other stuff I can do the same thing with nowadays. But, uh, yeah, you know, there was just one thing. Um, God, I got... Dozens of meters and frequency counters and just all kinds of crap. I mean, and here, I'm, this is just a, a little bit of some of the stuff that I brought inside so far. You know, here's a data precision, nothing fancy. Um, you could literally pick this meter up when it's got the plastic covers on it, which are sitting behind me here on the floor. You know, just, you know, standard covers, the, you know, the bench handle. Yes, this stuff is dirty as hell. And it, almost everything test equipment like this had holes mounted or has holes in the tops of it so I get the feeling all this stuff was screwed up to the underside of shelving in a, on a bench but uh, yeah I mean I brought it in you know it was 17 degrees when it came inside so I had to you know, wait for it to warm up and for the uh, the dew to you know condensation to dry off of it before I dared power all this stuff up but it's you know it's sat overnight and uh, yeah turned this on I mean I turned the first thing I plugged in was the the marker generator, the damn thing worked. I thought, man, what the hell? I'll try plugging some of this other stuff in, um, you know, power this up, and I actually have it hooked up to, and this came from the auction too, um, to a Heathkit uh, IN37 uh, resistance substitution box. So I've got it on a 1 meg resistor right there, and you can see it's measuring floating right around one now this doesn't have a gazillion decimal places after it you know it's a basic you know instrument so you know if we go down to the low range um, we'll go down to a 15 ohm resistor uh, let's see oh am i in the no we go down there yeah there we go and there's a 22 33 there's a 47. And you got to remember, this, the resistors in this thing probably, because they're going to be carbon composition. They're not going to be perfect uh, to start with. But uh, there's a 68, 100, 150. So, I mean, it appears to be working just fine. Uh, I checked the voltmeter. It works. The current amp meter function works. So, I mean, it's not like I need one, but, yeah, I got a bunch of these. Um, something I had never seen before. And I think they're just, I don't know what other to say other than I think they're cute. <laughs> and they're leader. Now, actually, you can see right there, there's uh, one of the labels, Catonsville Community College. But this is actually made by leader. I don't think there's, oh yeah, right there, you can see it on the bottom. Leader Electronics. Now, I have a bunch of leader uh, test equipment. A lot of frequency counters, RF power meters, all kinds of stuff. They made really good equipment. But I had no idea they made anything like this. It's just, a, it's like a mini bench meter. Um, yeah, there's a little crack in the top of this one, but I got a bunch of these. Um, here's another one. <laughs> like I said, I got, a, I got a stack of these things. I get the feeling there was a huge stack and some heavy weight came down because that looks like a footprint from the underside of one of the other ones. But, uh, yeah, and again, has screw holes in the top, so I assume this was screwed to the underside of a bench. But notice there's no AC power cord. And you'll also notice there's a fuse. Now, this is the fuse for the ohms and uh, amp meter function. And I guess that kind of makes sense. This was in a school environment. And, yeah, I'm sure fuses get blown probably several times a day. <laughs> so, what they actually took the covers off of one of these and looked at it. And all they did was is they popped the fuse out of the internal fuse holder, soldered wires to it, and mounted a fuse holder on the back side so you could stick a two-amp fuse in here. Uh, which kind of makes sense, makes it easy to get to. But if you notice, there's no AC power cord. This is battery powered, or there's a 6-volt DC jack on the side. But And actually, that was the first thing I tried to do 
was hook this up to the batteries and I, you know, just clipped on test leads, tried this set and it, that, well, actually this set is the shorting bar. So, you know, when I hooked up the, the power supply here, it just went into constant current mode. But uh, when I hooked them up here, nothing happens. Turned it on, I was like, oh, well, it doesn't work. I tried the next one, up, oh, doesn't work. I was, hmm, something, something's not right here. So that's the one I popped the cover off. What they did was they actually just cut the wires off of the battery compartment. So this thing has never had batteries in them. So all of them have battery compartments that are virgin. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, in a laboratory or, you know, a school environment, on a especially mounted to the underside of a bench well if this was or mounted to the underside of a shelf you'd never be able to get the cover off anyhow so you know they had this hooked up permanently to a wall wart so uh yeah what they did was they just clipped the wires off of the battery holders and it was you know would have been powered by this so i power, powered it up works just fine again much like this one uh you know it's not an ultra high resolution one but honestly, I mean, even for 99% of the work that I do working on radios, I don't need more than a couple decimal places. That's it. I don't need, you know, to know to the tens or hundreds of thousands or millionths of a volt, I mean, or ohms or whatnot. It's really useless. You know, like I say, there's a few very rare occasions I might need something like that. And it's usually when I'm not working on a radio. That's when I'm working on test equipment. But, uh, yeah, so I got a bunch of these. I think, like I said, I think these are just cute. Got the little, you know, the little built-in carry handle. Or, you know, it's also, you know, flip it around the other direction. It's it's the prop to set it up on a bench. But, uh, yeah, I'm actually going to keep a couple of these. And they all they all work. I tried all of them. I just, you know, once I had hooked up a, wired up a power jack for this thing, I just plugged in all of them. And every single one of them works. And these, like most, all, all of the other leader equipment that I have, ah, oh, they have that, easy to look at green LED displays. I'm such a big fan of the green green displays. That's one thing I really miss on modern equipment. It's just so easy on the eyes. Actually, it's kind of like this. The reds, same thing. Very easy on the eyes. No big, gigantic, bright, blaring, um, you know, display in your face. Um, <clears throat> some other stuff. Of course, I take everything apart. You know, that's uh, Dave Jones' philosophy. Don't plug it in, tear it apart. So, you know, I had to tear everything apart before I plug it in. Not only that, not knowing condition, but you know, this works. I got a bunch of these. These are little BK Precision 100 megahertz frequency counters. Really bottom rung, entry level type frequency counters. But it is 100 megahertz. Perfectly fine for radio work. And again, battery powered. I didn't even, I had, I had no clue leader made those little small battery powered bench style meters. I'd never seen those things. I've never seen one of these, a battery-powered frequency counter. Who knew? <laughs> I mean, hell, actually, with all the battery-powered stuff I got, I could make a mobile repair shop and just <laughs> run everything off of batteries. And interestingly enough, you can even charge with this because it has a alkaline or NICAD, which, yeah, NICAD kind of dates it. Um, you know, Nowadays, we'd be using nickel metal hydride or lithium. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it even has a built-in charger circuit. So if you had NICAD batteries, you could hook the battery pack up, hook up to your external battery jack on the back to power it, and it would also charge the batteries if you had NICADs in there. But, uh, yeah, like I say, I, I hooked up two, the, two of these out of the pocket. That's all I'd brought into these. I still got a bunch more of them. Um, but, yeah, powered them up. They work fine. I mean, again, not stuff that I really need. Um, I'll probably keep one maybe two of those because like i say they're kind of kind of neat being battery powered um actually let me get some of this stuff off the bench and i'll get a few other things that i got up on the bench so give me a second okay so uh here's something else i got a stack and yes it has the covers but of course like i said <laughs> always take it apart first you know here's the covers again these have holes drilled in the top so assume a Presumably they were, uh, you know, mounted to the underside of a shelf. But, uh, so this is a triple output power supply. I don't know what use I really had for these. I've got so many power supplies, but I thought it was like 10. Actually, I got 13 of these things. Um, but uh, they're triple output, 5 volt at up to 1.5 amps, and 2, uh, 0 to 20 volt at half amp. Um, I'll have to pull the data sheet on these or you know the owner's manual i don't know if these can be run in series or parallel i kind of doubt it but you never know um so it might be able to do up to one amp um if they were parallel but like i said, I, I don't know i'd have to pull the uh the manual for these but you know made by heath um 
you know, basic entry level power supplies. Now it's non current limiting, but uh, does have built in amp meter. And this one works. It's you know, there, some of this stuff's been beat up. There's a knob missing here or the cover, uh, which no problem for me because I have 12 other ones. <laughs> but uh, this one appears to work actually. I didn't try the last supply. Let me... Okay, 10 volts. Yeah, I mean, actually, if I fine-tune that, get right in front of the needle. Yeah, so, I mean, there it's... Try and get the meter face directly straight on. So, you can see, I got it right at 10 volts. And, and yeah, you can't see the meter because it's blinding it. Oh, let's see. Where in the hell are we? Utility system display invert. And you still can't see it for the glare now. 10.04 volts, and if I switch over to the other one, which I also have set to 10 volts, see 10.034 volts, and the 5 volt supply, which is non-adjustable, see that's the bottom scale, actually the as far as this meter is concerned, this one, the meter is showing a little bit low, and actually the voltage is a tad bit low, not much, but it's 4.961, so I mean, it's within a couple hundredths of a volt, but uh, yeah, works fine, absolutely, apparently nothing wrong with it, and you can see these, I guess, have been stored somewhere damp, maybe a garage, uh, because some of the screw heads have a little bit of rust on them, but you know, couple new screws and pff, shoot it look fine like I say replace that one knob that the outer now this is actually has an interesting thing it has a independent or tracking so if you flip this you can see a will track with B and that's where these two knobs here if you hold this one you can actually adjust this one so you can adjust one and then when you turn the back one that will track with it you know for a linear increase so you might set one you know this one it may be two volts when the other one's off completely but then as you turn this up by the time you get to two volts on this one this one will have increased to probably like four volts uh, but it's kind of neat it has a little tracking a double double knob uh, tracking feature there but uh yeah like i say it works nothing wrong with it um you know basic little supply uh, again I, you know if i was going to use this i definitely would recap it due to age but, uh, you know, man, that's 12,000 microfarad at only 15 volt. Holy crap, man. I mean, today, <laughs> 15 volt, whew, that would be tiny compared to that thing. Uh, and it does have a switch in the bottom because this can be run off, uh, again, 110, 220. Um, but, yeah, I'd probably recap it. But, yeah, I mean, good, good power supply. Uh, I mean, hell, even if this thing ever went bad... You bar barely need a schematic to diagnose the damn thing. Cause there's not, it's not that advanced, um, you know. And as hell, as far as calibrating, looks like two 500 ohm trimmer pots there. But uh, yeah, I mean, and being a Heath, Heath, Heath kit, same thing. Um, you know, and Schlumberger, uh, you know, it'd just be a matter of uh, downloading the manual for it. But yeah, nice, nice supply. Um, you know, it's got the covers on the back for the power transistors. Uh, but, you know, that was another thing. Now, something... Let me get this out of the way now. You have to give me a second. Now, the next one i got to run out here and grab. Uh, run out of room to stack shit around here. <laughs> oh, here was another thing. This thing's got some weight. Isolation transformer. You know, I think if somebody made a nice little plywood box for me, and hell, they even took the time to you know, slap a couple coats of varnish on it. Um, when I got this, when I was loading it up in the back of the truck, didn't even realize that uh, I thought it was had a, a, a variable resistor here, kind of you know, poor man's variac. No, actually, this one's this is a multi, and you can see it's a Hammond transformer uh, it's good for 250 volt amps um, now if you're not familiar with that that's actually what they usually rate transformers at is volt amps 
Um, they don't rate them at a specific current because they don't know exactly what exact voltage you'll be using it at. So they use that volt amp rating, but that works out to like 2.08 amps at 120 volts. But it's actually a multi-tap transformer. Um, actually, I wrote the two amps on there. But somebody made up a nice little dial, but it has taps at 90, 100, 110, 15, 20, and 130 volts. Um, yeah, somebody's kind of, it looks like, actually, because I had pulled this out of the box, it might have had another outlet in it at one point in time, and somebody upgraded to this one. But yeah, that's it's kind of below, so I might keep this, and actually I'll upgrade that. Uh, actually, there's no need for a ground pin, because you can see this has a... Uh, it's an isolation transformer. This has no ground, um, so it doesn't it doesn't need a three pin plug there. Actually, though, that does make it kind of handy because if you're working on something that has a three pin plug, um, you don't have to worry about using an adapter. But uh, yeah, works perfect. Like I say, good for two amps. So you know, there's a nice nice isolation transformer, and it's a Hammond man. And you can see, yeah, it's, this thing is heavy. I mean, it's with one hand at arm's length. I can barely. Oh, barely pick it up. Yeah, I mean it is heavy. <laughs> back, back when transformers were built like a tank. But uh, let me run out here. Where in the hell is that sitting at? Oh, okay. Let me pause the video. I actually, gotta unbury that. Okay, and the last little thingy I'm going to show you. And when I got there, I didn't even know really what I was getting. They pulled the tarp off, and there's a bunch of stuff sitting in front of. I actually got uh, two of these, but I could see about that much. <laughs> they started uncovering stuff. I could see like that much of the corner, and I knew what that was. I wasn't sure exactly what this was model-wise, but I knew the name Bogan, so I knew it was an amplifier, and it was probably tube type. Um, and I got it cheap. I got two of these. Now, this is a 100-watt amplifier. It runs a quad of output tubes. I'll pop the cover off really quick to show you, but like I got a pair of these things. These things regularly sell for a pair for well over a thousand dollars. So I mean, as long as the transformers are good, hell, it could need all the tubes. Um, I could care less. It's you know they're really nice amps. Um, I actually have one. Um, when I got but this one, I thought, woohoo, I now have a pair. And then I realized, no, actually, in that lot, I got two of these. So now I still have an oddball number. Um, now, the big advantage of these things is they have some jacks on the back that allow you to hook these up in parallel. You can just keep stacking these things. So if you need 200 watt amplifier, you just hook up two of these in parallel. If you need 300 watts, you hook up three of these in parallel. If you need 1,000 watts, you hook up 10 of these things in parallel. Um, oh, again, really heavy. But that's what these jacks down here are for. You just run, so if this was the first amplifier, you'd have a cable that runs from this one up to the jack on the next one. And then, you go again, you'd go from that output to the next amp, to the next amp, to the next amp, and you can just string them together. But uh, if these do have a downfall, um, they work fine. Like I say, they're great amplifiers. They're starting to get a really good reputation. You know, People are starting to discover this is, oh, that's that PA amplifier that was also used in a lot of industrial applications for stuff like vibrator tables. But uh, people are starting to discover this. But it, it does have the 25-volt, uh, 70-volt uh, outputs, so for like industrial applications. Um, but it has, you know, selectable low or high Z uh, input impedance. Yeah, the volume controls on the back, because this was, like I say, meant for industrial applications and settings and sound reinforcement and PA systems. So it was, yeah, you adjusted it one time and it was never touched again. But, uh, you know, it has 6 and, what is it, 16? Yeah, taps for 6 and 16 ohms there. Um, so there's no 8 ohm tap, but that, you know, that's easy to get around that. But that's kind of the downfall. Being it has the taps for, you know, for voltage, for use in uh, you know long run commercial systems, that can induce a little bit of distortion. Where some of the other amplifiers that aren't capable of doing the uh, the voltage system like this are going to be a little bit cleaner. But honestly, and it's really not that noticeable. Um, they do sound really good. I like I say, I have one of these and it's already restored. God, this thing is heavy. Oh. Now, let's see what do we got Phillips. I'll just pop the cover really quick. 
show you at least what the top side looks like. Yes, and this handle would not have been on here originally. That was a unfortunate uh, brain fart by somebody to drill holes in the top of the cabinet. Though, honestly, most people that run these things, like, run them covers off. Because yeah, they're using them for home stereo amplifiers. That's when you, know, you get two of these things, you get 200 watt mono block amplifiers, you know, and then you then you have a stereo amplifier. But uh, yeah, like I say, so that's I, actually I guess that's no biggie, and that's probably what I'll end up doing. I'll restore one of these units that I got to run with the one I already did. Oh yeah, still still has all the original dirt. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, nice and... <laughs> Need something to wipe my hand off. But, uh, you can see it runs a quad of 8417 output tubes. Now, a lot of people do all kinds of modifications. Some tube numbers on here somewhere. There we go. 8417s. Really good tube. Um, a lot of people will modify these to run like uh, KT120s. Yeah, honestly, I think they, you know, for at least what I'm going to be using them for, I think running a quad of 8417s is just fine. Good sounding tubes. This thing will put out a steady 100 watts continuous. And this is tube era 100 watts. So, you know, you could compare this thing to a modern day, some of these solid state amplifiers. Hell, this thing would probably compare to like a, 300 or 500 watt solid state amp nowadays because they they overrate their amplifiers so much nowadays um you know tubes have a lot of headroom for starters whereas you know transistors they reach to a point they just go poof you know let out the magic smoke tubes man they'll just keep going but that has a bunch of extra sockets oh, on the back here um for interfacing with uh you know remote control systems you can see standby controller um, this little jack here, that's not actually a missing tube. You can see it actually says X1. There's actually, that's for a transformer. Could plug in there, but there's your high, low uh, impedance input, um, speech and music, and then, like I say, accessory plugs and whatnot. And actually, if I remove this one, you can see right there, it says 100 watts. So, and it even has a... 120 volt plug here, so you know, plug in an accessory. But, uh, yep, so there's just uh, some of the uh, gadget and gizmos I got. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's no way I'm going to unload all that stuff now because, I, like I said, I got a shitload of stuff. Got several thousand vacuum tubes and more test equipment that I can shake a stick at, and 99% of it, I don't need it. So, yeah, I'll figure out something to do with it. But, uh, yeah, like I said, I was tickled pink, man. I got two of these things. And honestly, I probably got, if you consider all of the other shit that I got with this, I probably got them for 50 cents a piece. You know, if I divide between all the other pieces of equipment and stuff that I got in the lot that these two amplifiers came in, yeah, I probably paid 50 cents a piece for these things. So, yeah, I could care less if all the tubes are bad. No, if it did, no, I'm not plugging this in. Not even going to take a chance. The caps, it's got to get recapped first. Um, like I say, I'll test it i'll probably put in new tube sockets um actually they're vintage tube sockets but they're ceramic uh and then what i've done is i pop the pins out of them and i gold plate the uh, contact area uh now i don't gold plate the solder end but i do gold plate the contact surface where the tubes you know tube pins actually plug into them i got a bunch of those that i did a few years ago so i'll probably i'll probably change it usually when i rebuild amplifiers for myself that's usually what i do i put i put the ceramic sockets in but uh yeah i mean it's a good basic design power transformer output transformer yeah no you know bare bones basic industrial built to last forever um and they do that's you know that's why they're still around and a lot of times now like i said i'm not going to take a chance plugging it in but uh a lot of times you plug these things in and hell, they work just fine as is. Eventually the caps are going to explode on you, but, uh, yep, so there you go. There was a, just a, a, a sneak peek of some of the, uh, stuff that I picked up at the auction. And for all that shit that I got, it was less than $200 for everything. So, yeah, 
it's like I say, auctions, man. It, it's a great, I mean, don't get me wrong, eBay, I buy a shitload of stuff on eBay, but there's nothing beats a public auction, uh, especially if stuff's poorly listed and nobody else like you or me knows about it and you're the only person there that's interested in electronics. Yeah, you can frequently fill up a box truck, um, you know, with with a load of shit. <laughs> Uh, and I actually left a lot of stuff there. You know, it gets to a point, a lot of those power supplies, good example, those Heath power supplies, there were a couple of them there that the covers were missing on them. I was like, man, however many of them I tossed in the back of the box truck, I was like, I got to a point, I was like, ah, I don't, I'll just leave them here. I don't need the damn things. They can throw them away. Um, you know, I only got so, not that I have any time to start with, but, you know, I only have so much room to put <laughs> store shit like this. So, uh, there you go. So look uh, look forward in the future to probably, um, you know, some videos. I'll go over a few of those other little pieces of test equipment. Because like I say, a few of those, like those little liter meters, man, I think they're just cool as shit. Little miniature bench top meters that are battery powered and, and freak battery powered frequency counter. Who knew? So yeah, surprise, surprise.